Hello, and thank you all for coming. This is so fancy and formal and official seeming. And thank you for the lovely introduction. My mom is indeed an elementary school librarian, and now she laminates articles about me and puts them on the refrigerator, which is kind of weird because she has a laminating machine at school, which she abuses clearly. Um, but I want to thank everyone for coming, especially in the rain. Um, but and I want to apologize because I was supposed to be in Nashville in October. And I'm really sorry that I wasn't there. And I believe you were told that I was sick, which isn't exactly true. So I would like to tell you why I wasn't here. Um, so I went on this kind of crazy fall book tour. And I'm like a little debut author, like deer in headlights. I don't really know what a like, busy book tour is like. It's kind of really overwhelming with all the travel. And it's like nonstop. And um, I had been on the road for about a month when I was supposed to be here and I'd spent about four days in London. I've never been to Europe. I had never been to London. I've seen London through taxi windows. I still haven't really seen London. Um, but I was, I was traveling with my agent who happened to come to London with me because he is a very lovely man who knew it was my first overseas trip. So he came with me and I got back very late at night on a Thursday night. And it was supposed to be my fifth wedding anniversary but I'm separated and getting divorced but I was still going to have dinner with my not yet ex-husband, which was a little like emotional already, and I thought I had a day off the next day. And I turned my phone on when I, the plane landed, and I had my schedule, and it said I had to be back at the airport the next morning to come to Nashville, because I was there, supposed to be here from Friday to Saturday, which no one had told me. Um, so I went through customs, trying not to cry, and my agent was with me, and he called me an hour later to tell me that he canceled. So it was not my choice, you are getting a much better version of me right now than you would have in October, I promise. So I am thrilled to be here, and thank you all for coming. So um, you probably already know a little bit about kind of the, how the book came to be. I did indeed start it during National Novel Writing Month because I was always the kind of person that I thought about writing, and I didn't actually write anything. I'd like, think of writing. And the funny thing is when you think about writing, nothing actually gets put on a page. You have to write the words down. And, um, and I would try, I'd write maybe a page, and I would hate it, so I'd stop. Um, so I started doing National Novel Writing Month in around 2003, and it was a really great exercise for me because you're, you're forced to write 50,000 words in 30 days, which is a lot of words and a, not a lot of time, so I didn't have time to hate what I was writing because I had to keep writing. And it was a great way to shut off that sort of very self-critical part of my brain and not really care that like maybe like, most of what I was writing was not very good, but some of it wasn't half bad, and some of it maybe I could go back and fix and make better, and that's kind of how I sort of learned to write in a way, and, but I would never plan. I just kind of start at the beginning of the month with maybe a vague idea or a handful of characters, and in 2005, I had this sort of vaguely Edward Gorey thing with like mysterious people in fur coats like lurking, but that's all they were doing. <laughs> and, so after like thousands of words of this, I was like, this is really boring. And I got so bored, I didn't know what to do with it. And the nano rule of thumb is usually when in doubt, just add ninjas. But <laughs> I didn't really want to use ninjas, it seemed too easy. So I was like, what can I do that's exciting? What would be ninja-esque? So I was like, I'll send my characters to the circus. And right then, there's just this circus in my head, and it kind of already it was a lot of separate tents, and then there was a bonfire in the center, and this place was immediately so much more interesting than those boring people in their fur coats, so I kind of abandoned them, <laughs> and then just focused on the circus, and that's where the whole book developed from. I spent the next two years of National Novel Writing Month just writing about the circus. Technically, this is cheating because you're not supposed to work on something that you've already started, but like I'm friends with the National Novel Writing people now, so they'll probably forgive me for that. Um, so I had two years worth of National Novel Writing Month stuff about the circus, um, which is over 100,000 words, and um, it still didn't have a plot. Um, and to give you an idea of how rough and sprawling and how much it changed from that version to this version, Celia isn't in that at all. Um, <laughs> So it changed very drastically. Sometimes people ask, like, what was the scope of the revisions from start to finish? And I say, see how this book is about 400 pages long? Change every word on 350 of them, maybe? Like, that's approximately how much it changed. But that's where it started. And I think it, for me, I think 
I, and I am also a, a visual artist, and it helped for me to start thinking of writing more the way I thought of painting or any sort of other art. Like, I think there's this kind of mystique about books that, like, you think, like, the author, like, starts on page one and just, like, writes until they get to the end, and they write the end, and it's done. Which is kind of always the way I sort of thought maybe that's the way it's supposed to happen in my head. And then when I like allowed myself to be messy, because I'm a messy painter and I, I literally throw paint at things. Um, my studio gets very, very messy. Um, but I always think that there's layers of it. There's sketches, there's planning, there's like I scrap things and paint over them and, and it takes me a while to layer things up. And when I thought about writing in the same way, that's kind of when it clicked in my head that I could write the same way that I paint and let it be an entire process to get to a final product. Um, so it seemed to have worked uh, in this case. Um, and it's still a little kind of overwhelming, the, the response. The fact that I'm actually talking to people about my book is still a little bit surreal to me. Um, but luckily for you, because you're getting me like on this like bonus winter tour, like I've done this a couple times. So I, I, I can maybe even like look up while I read which I could not master for the longest time. Um, oh, but I have weird light right here. I might have to like adjust. So um, I'm just gonna read a little bit because I have more fun when we, like, you guys can ask questions and I can answer them because then it's more of a conversation and I'm just not just like talking at you, which just seems weird to me. This is very like official with the podium and everything too. Um, but I'm gonna read um, just a short section for you. Um, when I first came up with the idea of the circus, when it was this, like a location in my head, um, I, I knew it was a sort of like magical, wondrous place. And, I knew I needed that character that was gonna be like the Alice to the Wonderland or the, the Charlie to the Chocolate Factory or the Arthur Dent to the universe. And I knew I wanted it to be a, a younger character. I knew I wanted him to be American because it's always the British kids that like get to go to Narnia. And I was always annoyed. <laughs> when I was a kid because I'd read all these books like Alice and like all like no one was ever American like they didn't really have the like cool magical like classic story adventures so I was just like it has to be American and so um and I'm from Massachusetts so like the obvious thing is I'll, I'll have him be from Massachusetts but um I'm from coastal Massachusetts and I didn't want him to be a coastal kid because I didn't think I think if you live kind of by the ocean like dreams of piracy seem a little too attainable so it's like, make him a little landlocked. So I moved him inland a little bit, and I actually got out a map of Massachusetts and kind of started looking through towns. I was like, what would be good? And I could Concord. And Concord has such a great literary history with Thoreau and Emerson and all this. And I went and took a field trip. To, and I went out to Concord, and one of the first things when I got there, just kind of wandering around, was like this big open field, and there's a tree on the other side. And I was like, okay, <laughs> done. Bailey lives in Concord. Um, so, Bailey first encounters the circus when he's t like 10 years old in a game of truth or dare. And this is a section from the second time. Bailey revisits the circus when he's 15. And this is just a little section of Bailey exploring the circus. The particular path he chooses to wander down has no obvious doors. It is only a passageway between tents, endless stripes illuminated by flickering lights. He notices an uneven spot in the alternating black and white. Bailey finds a gap in the side of one of the tents, a split in the fabric, each edge dotted with silver grommets, and a black ribbon hangs just above his head as though this opening was meant to be laced together to keep the tent firmly closed. He wonders if some circus member forgot to relace it. And then he sees the tag. It is the size of a large postcard attached to the black ribbon the way one might attach a gift card to a present, the tag hangs loosely a few feet off the ground. Bailey turns it over. The picture side shows a black and white etching of a child in a bed covered in fluffy pillows and a checkered quilt, not in a nursery, but under a star-sprinkled night sky. The opposite side is white, with elegant calligraphy and black ink that reads, Bedtime Stories, Eventide Rhapsodies, Anthologies of Memory. Please enter cautiously and feel free to open what is closed. Bailey cannot tell if the tag refers to the break in the tent or if it has been misplaced from some other tent. Most of the tents have prominently placed signs in painted wood and entrances that are clearly marked. This one seems as though it was not meant to be found. Other patrons pass by on their way from one part of the circus to another, too absorbed in their conversations to notice him contemplating a postcard-sized tag by the side of a tent. Tentatively, Bailey pulls the unlaced flaps apart enough to peek inside to discern if this is indeed a separate circus attraction and not the back of the acrobat tent or some sort of storage area. 
He can make out only several twinkling lights and shapes that could possibly be furniture. Still unsure, he pulls the flaps apart enough to enter, stepping inside carefully per the instructions on the postcard, which proves wise as he walks directly into a table covered in jars and bottles and lidded bowls that rattle against one another. He stops, hoping not to knock anything over. It is a long room, the size of a formal dining room, or maybe it only resembles a dining room because of the table, which stretches the length of the tent, though there is enough room to maneuver around it carefully. All of the jars in the bottles are different. Some jars are simple glass mason jars, others are glazed ceramic jars or ornate frosted glass, bottles for wine or whiskey or perfume. There are silver lidded sugar bowls and containers that look rather like urns. They appear to be in no particular pattern or order, they are simply strewn across the table. There are additional jars and bottles around the periphery of the room as well, with some on the ground and some on boxes and tall wooden bookshelves. The only element that correlates the room with the picture on the the tag is the ceiling. It is black and covered with tiny twinkling lights. The effect is almost identical to the upward view of the night sky from outside. Bailey wonders how all of this might relate to a child in bed or to bedtime stories as he walks around the table. He recalls what the tag said about opening things, wondering what could possibly be inside all of these jars. Most of the clear glass ones look empty. As he reaches the opposite side of the table, he picks one at random, a small round ceramic jar glazed in black with a high shine and a lid topped with a round curl of a handle. He pulls the lid off and looks inside. A small wisp of smoke escapes, but nothing else. As he peers inside, he smells the smoke of a roaring fire and a hint of snow and roasting chestnuts. Curious, he inhales deeply. There is the aroma of mulled wine and sugared candy, peppermint and pipe smoke, the crisp pine scent of a fir tree, the wax of dripping candles. He can almost feel the snow, the excitement, the anticipation, the sugary taste of a striped candy. It is dizzying and wonderful and disturbing. After a few moments, he replaces the lid and puts the jar carefully back on the table. He looks around at the jars and bottles, intrigued but hesitant to open another. He picks up a frosted glass mason jar and unscrews the silver metal lid. This jar is not empty, but contains a small amount of white sand with shifts on the bottom. The scent that wafts from it is the unmistakable smell of the ocean, a bright summer day at the seashore. He can hear the sound of waves crashing against the sand, the cry of a seagull. There's something mysterious as well, something fantastical. The flag of a pirate ship on the far horizon, a mermaid's tail flipping out of sight behind a wave. The scent and the feeling are adventurous and exhilarating, with the salty tinge of a sea breeze. Bailey closes the jar and the scent and the feeling fade, trapped back inside the glass with its handful of sand. Next, he chooses a bottle from a shelf on the wall, wondering if there is any distinction between jars and bottles on the table and the ones that surround it, if there is an indiscernible filing system for these curious containers. This bottle is tall and thin, with a cork held in place by silver wire. He removes it with some difficulty and it opens with a popping noise. There is something in the bottom of the bottle, but he cannot tell what it is. The scent wafting from the thin neck is bright and floral, a rose bush full of dew dripping blossoms, the mossy smell of garden dirt. He feels as though he is walking down a garden path. There's the buzzing of bees and the melody of songbirds in the trees. He inhales more deeply and there are other flowers along with the roses, lilies and irises and crocuses. The leaves of the trees are rustling in the soft, warm wind and the sound of someone else's footsteps falling not far from his own. The sensation of a cat brushing past his legs is so genuine that he looks down expecting to see it, but there is nothing on the floor of the tent but more jars and bottles. Bailey puts the cork back in the bottle and returns it to its shelf. Then he chooses another. Tucked in the back of one of the shelves is a small bottle, rounded with a short neck and closed with a matching glass stopper. He picks it up carefully. It is heavier than he had expected. Removing the stopper, he is confused for, at first, the scent and the sensation do not change. Then comes the aroma of caramel, wafting on the crisp breeze of an autumn wind. The scent of wool and sweat makes him feel as though he's wearing a heavy coat with the warmth of a scarf around his neck. There's the impression of people wearing masks. The smell of a bonfire mixes with the caramel. And then there's a shift, a movement in front of him, something gray a sharp pain in his chest, the sensation of falling, a sound like howling wind, 
or a screaming girl. Bailey puts the stopper back, disturbed. Not wanting to end on such an experience, he places the strange little bottle back on its shelf and decides to choose one more before leaving. He picks one of the boxes on the table this time, a polished wood box with a swirling pattern etched into its lid. The inside of the box is lined with white silk. The scent is like incense, deep and spiced, and he can feel smoke curling around his head. It is hot, a dry desert air with pounding sun and powder soft sand. His cheeks flush from the heat and from something else. The feel and sensation of something as luscious as silk falls across his skin in waves. There's music that he cannot discern, a pipe or a flute, and laughter, a, a high-pitched laugh that blends harmonious with, with the music. The taste of something sweet but spicy on his tongue. The feeling is luxurious and lighthearted, but also secretive and sensual. He feels a hand on his shoulder and jumps in surprise, dropping the lid down on the box. The sensation ends abruptly. Bailey stands alone in the tent, underneath the twinkling stars. That is enough, he thinks. He goes back to the flap in the tent wall, careful not to disturb any of the jars or bottles nearby. He stops to adjust the tag that hangs from the ribbon on the tent flap so that it is more easily visible, though he is not certain why. The illustration of the child asleep in his bed beneath the stars faces outward, but it is difficult to tell if the child's dreams are peaceful or restless. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now if you want to ask questions, I can try to answer them and try not to babble too much because I have a tendency to babble. And we have assistance so I can hear. Anybody, no one ever wants to be first, it's okay. Yep. Yay, volunteers. Um, actually, I had a question about your tarot deck, which oh, is cool. not, I know, I know you're a multimedia artist and I'd heard that it was out of stock, are you going to be restocking that? That what's out of stock is that um, years ago, and I'd been, I kind of worked on, um, I, while I was writing the book, I um, painted a black and white 78 card tarot deck. I lived in monochrome for a very long time. Um, but um, while I was working on it, there was a limited edition made um, by this guy in Scotland who just does like, um, he collects tarot for like artistic value and sometimes a small press runs of um, independent uh, artist tarot. So he actually approached me and was just like, like, I wasn't even done with the whole deck. He was just like, would you like a limited edition of it? And I was like, sure, that's really cool. And did it, wonderful, wonderful. Like the guy, like he makes no money off of them. They're just like that labor of love sort of thing. So there is a, a limited edition of 100 of just the major arcana made several years ago um, that somehow, they probably still show up on like tarot collector like sites occasionally, but um, there has never been a published version of the full deck. I am like, it is on the to-do list, <laughs> but my to-do list gets kind of crazy right now. So I do eventually want to, um, to have a full deck published, but I'm kind of a snob when it comes to tarot cards. Like, like the card stock needs to be nice and like, I want them to be, a, I want them to be a nicely produced deck. So I, I want to make sure I take my time and don't just be like, yes, someone do it. So, cause I, I want to be more involved in the process. So hopefully eventually there will be a, a full Phantomwise tarot. And I, when there is, like everyone asks me like, when's the tarot deck coming? I will say like, it will be on Twitter, it'll be on my blog. Like people will know when, when the deck is coming. You're very welcome. There was one down here. Okay, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, can hear. No. I was like blessed by the book design gods, like seriously. And authors really have absolutely no input like, whatsoever on cover design, on, on book design at, at all, especially debut authors. So I, I, no one even asked me like, what would you like the cover to be like? I think at one point I was like, can we stick to a color scheme maybe? And I actually saw the interior design before I ever saw the cover. And like, I know people like say that like they have like 
saw the cover of their book and like I thought it was like it was that moment where like oh it's a real book. Mine was when I saw the interior design um, because it's just so like the the care and the thought that was put into it. And my like immediately after um, my editor acquired the book, one of the first things she said to me was that she knew exactly who in production that she wanted to do the interior design. At that point, I don't know that much about book production. I was just like I'm not even sure what that means. So okay, but I know what she means now because it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> And I really like the, the pages with like the, the sprinkling of stars because I think they look like they could be stars, but they also look like they could be like sparks from the bonfire. Um, and um, with the cover, and I, and I really had no idea what they were going to do because you could kind of do anything. And, I, and I'd said that sort of like color scheme, but um, I really didn't know what I, I got the like email with the like this is the cover and really had absolutely no idea what to expect. But had they asked me for any sort of input, one of the things I would have suggested not with specifics, but in a general sense, was paper art. Because there's so much paper in the, like, in the book, like the paper animals and all that, and it, it seems like the right texture for, for something. And, and th there's so much gorgeous, gorgeous, like pa both paper art and book art. Like people do like the book sculptures, like, like, like completely geek out over. Um, so the fact that they did a paper sculpture for it, I just like, I was so, so happy. And they actually, um, after the, the book came out, they, um, Doubleday gave me the original art they, as a present, I have it in a shadow box at home. It's, it's absolutely stunning. Um, so yes, I'm very, very, very pleased with, with both the entire design, especially because I am a visual artist. I am a very visual person. Even when I'm writing, I'm mostly trying to translate pictures in my head because that's just the way I think. And sometimes it's kind of hard to distill images into words. And I think half of like kind of learning to write for me was trying to translate things like that because like, that's how I, I picture it, and even down to like, how, how things are lit. I also have a background in theater, so um, I'm always directing things in my head, like I'm staging it, like I know where people are standing, I'm just like, and I do for like, every character, I do that like, acting thing, I have to know everyone's motivation. And, like, and, and it, it's, I think it results in something that maybe is a little more like, sensory and, and, and visual, than I, and I think it's because that's, there's something in um, Stephen King's On Writing, about um, how um, writing is telepathy, where I'm taking something in my head and writing it down so you can read it and get it in your head. And that's how I, I, I really always loved that when, when I first read that book, and that's kind of how I always think of writing, and as I'm trying to transmit stuff that's in my head into someone else's head and trying to do it as clearly and concisely as I can. Um, oh. What advice would you give to someone who is trying to write a book? Uh, I steal my best writing advice. I steal it from Neil Gaiman because it was the best writing advice I heard when I was writing, which is very simple. It is keep writing and finish things. The finishing things is so much harder than it sounds because it, it, it's tricky to get to that point where it, it feels like it's, it's done. And I think I also kind of, in conjunction with that, think in terms of it's a Da Vinci quote, art is never finished, only abandoned. Um, and kind of getting it to that letting go point. And um, it's okay if you let it go and it wasn't really done, because then you can, if it wasn't done, you'll probably be able to get it back and work on it more. And, and, and I am a big, big like, encourager of revising. I know some people are like kind of anti-revising it. Like, um, I think that's where you find more interesting things. Like it, it's like going back through, like, if, it's, if you did one draft of a, a, a novel or a story or anything, I think it's kind of like you find certain things when you go take your first trip through it. It's like exploring like a house in the dark with a flashlight. Like when you revise, you can go back through the same rooms and take your time and see what's in the corners and, and kind of flesh out things and, and kind of, um, that's the sort of thing that like, I find interesting in my process. And I also think every writer's process is different. I think maybe because the end product is all just words on a page and it's like a book is a book is a book, but every book kind of has a different way of getting there. Like I've, ta I've talked to lots and lots of writers at this point and I don't think any of us are really like, sit down and have the same process. Like I know like there are writers that sit down and write. Like they, I've heard that like you have to write every day. I don't write every day. Like I'm a binge writer. Like I write a lot in short amounts of time. And I think this is probably because I started with doing National Novel Writing Month. So uh, the way I write, I write a lot in short amounts of time. And then I will go for stretches without writing. But 
I've always got stuff in my head. I'm jotting down notes if I have them. Like, but you're, like, you're not, not writing even if you're not putting words on paper. Like, if the story is in your head and you're working on it and you're letting it simmer. And like, um, my other best writing advice I think is let yourself be surprised, because I think everything like I've done is like, I wouldn't if I was an outliner, this book wouldn't exist. Um, because this book was a surprise and I let things happen without trying to have too much control over what was going on on the page, just kind of let things run wild. And I think it's a little more fun, at least for me, that way. Um, but I think it can also be very rewarding and, and it's kind of like that free-flowing creativity thing. Or like interesting things happen when you're like not trying to get something else to happen. I think if I have any other writing advice. And that's pretty, I, I, I keep just stealing from Neil, like keep writing and finish things. I think it kind of boils down to that. Yes. It's always interesting to find out what kind of influences are going on, you know, what kind of books you were reading, what kind of music you were listening to when you wrote the book. Can you share any of that? Sure. Um, I have a lot of influences. I kind of, it's hard to say for me, like, I think probably everything I've ever read has influenced me in one way or another. There, um, this book in particular has some more direct influences. I think there's definitely a heavy Shakespeare influence um, because, again, I'm background in theater and, and that sort of thing. And I knew it want, I wanted it to have that like kind of extra great dramatic like Shakespearean feel. And then there are like the, the Shakespearean allusions like here and there. And when I was kind of um, developing the plot more and, and because it didn't have a plot at first um, and I was thinking about it and working on it and I was just like oh well because I had this idea I was just like oh I kind of want to do this and I was like if I do that it's going to be Romeo and Juliet maybe I should just let it be Romeo and Juliet so that's good and then there's lots of allusions to the Tempest and things like that and I think it also has a um, especially with the Bailey side of things has like a, um, a Dickens or a Roald Dahl influence on, on that side and and um, a little more modern, I think, um, a couple books in particular that had a direct influence on it um, were Susanna Clarke's Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Um, just like, just this wonderful doorstopper of a book that's like, that, again, that, that historical magic aspect of it. And um, Christopher Priest's The Prestige, both the book and the film, which are both very different but very good, um, flavor-wise with like the, the like top hats and, and that sort of thing was it definitely, um, and stylistically, just at the, the structure of the book, um, Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman, which is one of my absolute all-time favorite books. Uh, and I love the little vignettes. And so I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do like a short chapter sort of like vignette idea rather than like long sprawling things. So that's kind of where the original structure of the book, like lots of like different like art-wise and, and music-wise. Actually, there's, I have a circus playlist that's online somewhere that, that, that um, I think, I know Doubleday has links to it, but there's like all sorts of things on it. Um, there's like um, bits from Bernard Herrmann, um, Hitchcock soundtracks and, and things like that. And um, visual art was a lot of that sort of that, that Victorian style, like black and white. Like I love, um, and can go back to the color scheme of it, that, that like that Victorian era etching, that, that very strong black and white look I, is an aesthetic that I just love. And um, also I think it has that sort of like a Magritte -like flavor with the bowler hats in there too. Those, those are some of them. I think there's a lot, but like those, I think are, are a couple of the big ones. So are we picking? Are we giving up on microphones, Jimmy? We'll, we'll okay, we'll, we'll try. It's fun to have a microphone, though. So um, I'm wondering which tent would you feel most at home in in the circus? And if you had to like start from scratch and make a tent that was just for you, what what would your tent look like? Ooh, okay. The first part is easier than um, the other. My favorite tent in the circus, and the tent that I feel like I could go to the circus, the tent I know I would spend like all my time in, is the labyrinth because as a space, it's the one like I most would like want to explore, and I love that idea of you never know what's behind the next door. Like, it's, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm really big on space, which is, I think it was probably like an architect in a past life or something, because um, I have no skill whatsoever for like doing any of that right now, but I can make it up if I don't have to think about how it's put together. So like, that idea of like, different like rooms and like, the, the hallway where it snows and that, that sort of thing, um, and also it's, become my favorite in the book because of the, the context it ended up having, even after I kind of invented it as a space, it ended up being very meaningful in the story. So like then it has that extra layer. So that's definitely my favorite. If I had to do another one, I really don't know. There are a couple that didn't make it into the book um, that are actual tents. And um, there's one that was, I was just reminded of before we started, I got to like be shown the, the, the puppet room 
back there. It's just like absolutely amazing. But, um, and I, there was a, a tent that was all shadow puppets. It's actually alluded to at one point when Bailey's reading um, about the circus. And um, it was all kind of paper screens at, at, with shadow puppets, um, to, which I think is actually, it might be online somewhere, buried in like one of those like extra bits from like that didn't make the, the like DVD extras that they throw up on like random places online. Um, and there's, um, there's a tent that I know is somewhere that I don't think I'd want to visit, but um, I, I had a, a reference to it at some point, and I can't describe what's in it because it's the idea of the tent is that anyone who's ever found it can't describe it afterwards except to say it's the most frightening thing they've ever experienced. It's a little bit on the, the darker edge, but so I don't know what's in it, but I'm not sure I want to find out either. Let's have microphones. I think the microphone is like a nice kind of like, you have the microphone. Like. I wondered if you have a sister. I love the way you talked about the sisters and especially how much uh, Lainey was loved. And I, I, I even I do have I a sister and she was mad stopped. at me about the Burgess sisters. If anyone hasn't read the book, we won't say why. Um, but um, I do have a sister. She is five and a half years younger than me. She is um, engaged in getting married next summer, so it's great in my family because when we get sick of talking about book stuff, we can talk about wedding stuff. And when she gets stuck talk, talking about wedding stuff, we then go back to talking about book stuff. But no, like, um, I do in the, that sort of sister relationship. We're not quite as close. Because <laughs> they're not twins, and we kind of have that sort of like we're, we're polar opposites in a lot of ways, but we do often um, the the whole thing where they get mistaken for each other, but they're not even twins. Which my sister, being five and a half years younger than me, is always kind of mad that people think we're twins. Um, now that I have the short hair, she has very long curly hair, so we don't get that quite so much anymore. But I do indeed have a sister, so that, that there is a little bit in that relationship. She was mad at me because she was like, like everyone has terrible parents. It's like, what do you think mom and dad are going to say? I was just like, oh. I was like, no one was really supposed to be like anyone. This isn't like a really like autobiographical piece. <laughs> like, and people like ask like, oh, who is this based on? I was like, these are just people that live in my head. They're not really based on anybody. The little bits, little bits of characters are, are from like, a lot of them are little bits of me more than they're other people. But no, no, nothing really autobiographical. No, I take that back. Actually, Chandrash is slightly based on some of my experience in, in my theater with, um, it's a kind of weird position to be in the, a director and kind of you're so involved in something and then it's done and it's kind of self-sufficient and it's a weird position to be in, like to kind of have been so involved in something and then kind of have to let it go and on to the next thing and it sometimes takes a while to get on to the next thing. I never drank that much brandy, but he is like, that is kind of a, based on an actual experience. I'm curious why you chose to do a nonlinear timeline throughout the book. Uh, well, at first, the timeline was even less linear than it is now, back when it was a mess, and that was one of the problems with it. Um, partially because originally, my idea, again, with the, like, the short vignettes, I wanted the book itself to feel like the circus. I wanted it to be little separate experiences and little bits of story to like, like the way you'd get a tent at a time, you get like a bit of the story at a time, but it ended up being far too convoluted. Um, what I ended up doing, and like, I think technically, if you wanna get really pedantic about it, it's not actually nonlinear. It just has two overlapping timelines. Nothing's out of order, it's just that Bailey's storyline takes place in a different time than the main storyline, and they're overlapped. Um, which I, like, I know a lot of people have complained that it gets confusing. It's just like, I tried to make it not confusing. Like I like, we put dates on things. I blame the fact that they put the, the dates in a really small font, even though the, the interior design is gorgeous. The dates could have been a slightly bigger font. Um, but it, I, and like, that was the original idea, because and, and, I, I really kind of enjoy a nonlinear storyline. I think it makes it, it also kind of made it feel a little more dreamlike, which is always something I wanted the book to have as a quality of the, Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> As a quality of the, the story and the way it was told. I am really glad that I didn't do it completely nonlinear. It would have been like, you know, like memento kind of crazy, like nonlinear. It would have been probably a bad scene. Um, I listened to your book, and I wondered if you chose Jim Dale to read it. I did not choose Jim Dale. This was my agent's idea. This was the reason my agent's awesome. He's just like, 
think we should have Jim Dale do the audio. It's just like, okay, you work on that. I don't know how that happens. I don't know if we like call Jim Dale and say, like, but apparently you do just call Jim Dale and like you give him the book. And luckily enough, he really liked the book. And I actually got to see a little bit of the recording when they were recording it. I got to go in and, and meet Jim Dale and be in the studio. And it was really, it was a fascinating process to watch because um, it, I got to talk to him a little bit about it and he was telling me, he's done a lot of these, of course, of all the Harry Potters and, and everything. Um, he said he's never listened to anything that he's done. But uh, partially, bec well, he said partially because he doesn't like the sound of his own voice. And I was just like, dude, you have like, the <laughs> best storyteller voice ever. Um, I really just can't, but I understand that like when you hear your voice recorded, it doesn't sound the way it does in your head, so I, I get that. Um, and also, they do it essentially in one take. He reads about three pages or so straight through, and they'll go back, and anything that they didn't quite get or they wanted to redo, they'll just do like those little like little pickup sort of bits, and that's it. Like, um, so it is really just kind of one take. Um, but it was extraordinary watch, and I thought it would be strange to hear my words in someone else's voice, but he has the perfect storyteller voice. Like, it's really just like, it's, and it's a fascinating, I haven't listened to the whole book, but I've listened to like a large amount of it, and it's fascinating to me because it sounds the way it does in my head, and it doesn't, but it still sounds right. And of course, the, the great thing was in getting to sit and watch him record it, and like, I got to watch him like sitting there talking and then stumbling over things and stopping and looking at me through the glass wall in the studio and complaining that I named her Tsukiko because it's hard to say. And I was like, I am sorry, Jim Dale. I did not realize you were gonna have to say her name quite so much when I was writing this book. So I am so, so pleased with the audio and I think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, kind of on the same lines, who do you want <laughs> or see cast in the movie? Everyone asks me this and I never have really good dream cast like, responses. I'm not. I don't picture actors when I'm writing. Like I know some some writers do. Like they have that. Like this is like this would be the perfect person to play. It's the only actor I ever associated with a character in my head was um, Hector Bowen, who's Prosper the Enchanter. Was always kind of Jeffrey Rush esque in my head. Not that he looked exactly like Jeffrey Rush or like, um, but something about the air like was that was kind of the right association for me with him. But really, I think. And, and again, I think having a background in theater and kind of knowing like actors and the whole acting process, I think anyone they cast is going to bring something unique to each role. And I think all the roles would have a lot of possibilities, could be a lot of different people. I, I don't like to physically describe anybody too much, so there's not that many things to like, that, well, this would have to be like this type of actor. And like so I think there's some, some leeway in, in a lot of the characters. Like Bailey is never physically described at all, except he's tall. Like that's it. So like, he could really be anyone. I hope they do find unknowns for, for the kids, for, for Bailey and Pop and Widget, because I think that would be like, I hope it's the kind of thing where they actually use like lesser known actors and then maybe in a few side parts, like have somebody great and famous be like Madame Padva and like that sort of thing. Um, like a Helen Mirren or a Maggie Smith or somebody like. Um, but um, for most of the roles, I think it would be interesting to find like lesser known actors and also for, and this was an idea I had like, ages ago, and, this, and I had suggested this, that um, in a very vague sense, I would love it if they cast someone as Alexander who you remember the actor from when they were younger so you can see the passage of time. That I think, it, like, I'm not that I'm set on any sort of particular actor, but that I think would be an interesting like, quality to have for his character. But really, like, more so than the actors, I want to see the costumes. Like, oh my, like, that's the kind of thing, like, like, like the, in the film, is like Hollywood's weird and slow, and like they're like having meetings, but it's not like they're like really ready to roll on anything yet. Um, but like, I mean, I can say these things. Like, I write like, like these like fantastic gowns, and now someone's gonna have to sew the thing. Like, someone's gonna have to put buttons. And never in a million years did I think someone's gonna have to figure out what this clock looks like. Like. Like, or rather, someone's gonna have to CGI like <laughs> this clock. But like, it wasn't anything. I was. I never even fathomed while I was writing. It was enough of me, like, we surpassed Wildest Dreams, like, so long ago. Like, I just wanted it to be a book that people could read. Like, that was it. I was not thinking any, like, I was like, I'm not sitting and I think, like, okay, well, this person could direct the movie and this thing. I wasn't doing that at all. Like, I still don't really know. It's like, I, I want someone to direct it who, like, is passionate about the material. Like, I don't really have, like, the, like, 
particular people in mind. So I, I'm kind of just along for the ride at this point, and so it, it's all very exciting to me. It is, it is still kind of in that very slow stages where I'm not really sure what's going on. Like Summit has been wonderful and enthusiastic, but they just got bought by Lionsgate, and no one actually really told me that directly. I know because I read it online. So. <laughs> I am assuming this doesn't really impact anything and things are still like kind of moving and people are calling other people's people and having meetings, but I don't really know because they don't really tell me much. But I will kind of be involved once they get things rolling in the point where they will actually tell me what's going on. Not that I'll get to do much of anything, but I will be informed. Here. You would ever turn it into a stage play? Oh, I don't know if I would ever turn it into a stage play. What I would do was uh, is possibly like the theatrical rights. I would just hand off to this company called Punch Drunk, um, which is a British theater company that does immersive theater. Um, I first encountered them. They're actually in the acknowledgments of the book because I encountered them um, when they did their first U.S. production in Boston in years ago now, um, when I was in the middle of revising, and it was it's an immersive Hitchcockian Macbeth, which they're um, you go in, you get a mask, and you get set, told not to speak, and you get set loose in a space where this entire production is going on around you. And you can choose where to go, you can just look through rooms, and the, it's, it's the closest thing I've ever experienced in real life to walking into a dream. And because of that, it's the closest thing I've ever experienced in real life to what I think the circus would feel like. So like I geeked out like nobody's business. And I'm like the jaded former theater girl too. Like it takes a lot to impress me. Like, so I kind of flipped out about it. And like that sort of very different avant-garde idea where you could actually walk into the space of the circus. That is, if there's going to be a theatrical production of it, that's the kind of thing I would want to do. We are going to take one more question. <sighs> Um, because Erin is going to be signing books at the end of the hall, so... Um, you can ask me additional questions while I'm signing. Yes, if while you're signing. Is there question. anybody else who wanted to ask a question? Sorry, did you... Last question, it's a okay. lot of pressure. Down the front. Okay. Get a microphone. It's coming, it's coming. How far along are you on the next one? On the next book? Yeah. Oh, that's a mean question. That's a mean question to end on. It's like, no, it's a good question to end on. Um, I am very, very lucky in that um, I already had something started before this book sold. Um, because when I've handed that final like, draft, or what ended up being the final draft, back to my agent um, at, the, at the end of summer uh, 2010, um, a normal person would have taken a break after rewriting a book all summer, but no. I sat down and I wrote like 20,000 words in a week and a half of something new. Um, so um, I've been working that, on that kind of periodically. Um, it is still in that very messy stage where it doesn't know what it wants to be yet. It is probably best described right now as a film noir flavored Alice in Wonderland. Um, so it's very different. It's kind of a much different aesthetic. I'm playing in like a 30s, 40s kind of vibe instead of the, the Victorian Edwardian idea. Um, but I'm having a lot of fun with it and um, I, don't really know what my year looks like. I know I'm here and I'm in Atlanta tomorrow and I have a couple of days off and then I'm in Canada and then I beg to have a couple of weeks to, like, at home. So I'm hoping I'll have a couple of weeks to write then, but then I don't know and I'll have a paperback tour at some point. And like, so I'm hoping I'll have a draft of it done some point this year and then of course it will be another at least like a year if not a year and a half after it's finished until when it's published. So it's gonna be a while, but I am working on it. I promise I'm not gonna pull like a Donna Tartt and take 10 years, like I will. <laughs> have it, it like it w might be a couple of years but I am working on it and I'm working on it kind of whenever I have time because I do I very much I love to write no one really told me that once you get successful as an author you don't really have that much time to write which I still don't think is very fair um, but I'm definitely working on it and it will be um, book shaped eventually I hope that's it so we're good and we'll sign things well thank you all so so much thank you